Hello and welcome to coverage of Pro Tour Ether Revolt. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Ian Duke. We're ready for round 13 action here, where we've got Alexander Hain versus Ken Yukihiro. There's Alex. He's from Canada. He's playing for Team Face to Face Games here at this PT. Uh, on the other side of the table, Ken Yukihiro from Team Musashi. And it looks like they're ready to go. So the matchup is this Alexander Hain is on Mardu Vehicles, Ken Yukihiro is on black green constrictor. Now there's a few different versions of decks playing wanting constrictor and having a black green base, but some of them have some energy cards going and there's a few different things. So we'll kind of discover that as we work our way through this game here. The key storyline between these two players, though both of them are nine and three. A loss in most scenarios will eliminate you from top eight competition here at the Pro Tour. The fourth loss is usually the death knell for you. So this is a massively important match to both. They've still got work to do, whoever ends up winning it, but uh, a loss here it, it is really bad for either player. A glint sleeve siphoner there for Ken Yukihiro. Immediately gets shocked. And a heart of Kieran is a follow-up play. For yeah, Alexander pretty nice catch up there for Hain being on the draw, able to answer Ken Yuki Hero's two mana card with a one mana shock and then deploy a part of here in there. Here comes Scrap Heap Scrounder yeah. to, to crew things up and, you know, Hain's off to a pretty good start here. Oh, we're racing now, buddy, because he actually had a shock in his hand, another one as well. Unfortunately, the Long Tusk Cub with two energy in the bank, that wasn't going to get the job done and a really nice follow-up for Ken here. Winding Constrictor means not just one counter, but two instead. Then he's going to pick up another couple of energy here and uh, even get an extra one from the Winding Constrictor. This little one-two punch actually does give Ken the ability to race even though he's stuck on two lands here. Attention players. If you see yeah, it can't be overstated just how powerful and important the Winding Constrictor is uh, to this black-green deck, and especially in this matchup here. It's, it's one of the main ways where the black-green deck can just kind of snowball the game. Ooh, cancel that order. Unlicensed Disintegration is going to take down the Long Tusk Cub. He made sure to do it on his main phase while the shields were down. Doesn't want to get hit by something like a Blossoming Defense. And that was a big swing in the wrong direction here for Ken Yukihiro. And this lack of mana is really starting to catch up to him. Even with the Walking Ballista on two. He's just passed the turn back. Hayne looking really, really good here. And you yeah. know what, Marshall? Heart of Karen looking really impressive in this game. Just four power and flying especially. Five. Really, really difficult for the black green deck to deal with. Oh, yeah, with the uh, absent removal spell. It's smashing now. And bang, this is just getting worse and worse for Ken Yukihiro. That has to be game, right? Unlicensed disintegration number two from Alex means that Ken's on two with two lands in hand, facing down at least one lethal threat. Let's see if he has any way to get out of this. And Hain with shock in hand. Uh, I mean, if, right. if Hain had a second red source, that would have been the game right there on the previous turn. Yeah, there's I think, no way. Yeah, Ken Yukihiro with, with no way to gain life at all is just going to fall to that shock on the following turn. We've noticed that standard's been pretty quick, and uh, this game is no exception to that. This has been fast. Yeah, these are certainly very, very high-powered decks here. Uh, I think part of that, Marshall, is, is the... The inclusion of the um, Sahili Rai combo in the metagame mm -hmm. kind of forces decks to be very fast and proactive. Make sure that they can end the game before uh, giving the combo decks too, too much time. So Alex gets to just attack for lethal and then just shock him after Ken taps out. And that will do it for game number one. Alexander Hain picks up the game. No problem whatsoever. I, I think you said it, Ian. It was really all about Heart of Kieran there getting the job done in game number one. And uh, now Ken yukihiro has got to win back-to-back -back games against Alex Hain. That is not easy to do. We're going to bring you that plus much more after these messages. Put your game to the test at a Grand Prix. These Magic celebrations are headlined by two-day open tournaments with the best players in your region as well as top Magic pros from around the world. Find an upcoming Grand Prix near you at magic.wizards.com slash Grand Prix. Looking for a place to try out new decks and strategies? Head to your local game store and check out Friday Night Magic. Get more info at wizards.com slash FNM.
And welcome back to the feature match area here in Dublin. Marshall Sutcliffe with Ian Duke. We're watching Alexander Hain versus Ken Yukihiro. And it looks like they're ready to go. So off we go here in game number two. Game number one ended up being very quick when Ken missed a few land drops. And Alex just kind of ran him over with the heart of Kieran. Looks looking to run him over again here as well with the Toolcraft Exemplar on turn one. And no answer, at least as of yet, from Ken Yukihiro, though. There may be one. Here's a heart of Kieran. No, there isn't one. So take three. And this could be another quick one, though. Now Ken gets to untap with three mana and see what he can do. Yeah, I think ideally Ken would want something like a Grasp of Darkness here or a Fatal Push to take out that Heart of Kirin. That has been the uh, the one downside to Heart of Kirin, is it? It's, it's been Fatal Push a heck of a lot this weekend. Yeah, very true. But beyond that, it's performed nicely. We do see a murder in Ken Yukuhiro's hand. He could opt to pass the turn, you know, hope Alexander cruise the Heart of Kirin and then murder it. But there's a lot of danger in a play like that. I mean, you know, Hain might decide to play around it. He might have a second Heart of Kieran in his hand, you know, which sort of uh, unlocks it since it's a legendary uh, vehicle. Mm -hmm. But I think with Ken Yukihiro's alternative play just being playing a Rishgar by itself, I think leaving up the murder is kind of his only option here. Mm -hmm. Just so going to take some it. damage as it turns out. So murder the Heart of Kieran. But that trigger still happens for the Toolcraft exemplar, so, exemplar. so that's uh, six damage from that one drop alone, and Ken's down to 14. So a small step in the right direction for Ken Yukihiro, but I definitely think Alexander Hain is advantaged here, you know, coming out of the gates with Ken having a pretty slow and reactive start. Yeah, Ken's got a fatal push in his hand, I believe, but unfortunately his Rishkar on its own as a 3-3 just doesn't match up well against the two three-powered threats from Alexander Hain. I mean, sure, you can trade it off, but... He was hoping for a little bit better of a blocker than that. Yeah, that's true. But if he did pick up a fatal push this turn, that would be a really, really nice draw. Allowing him to play two spells in the same turn is like one of the you know key things he would need to do to come back in this game. Yeah, that is a hallmark of a comeback for sure. A scrap heap scrounger number two for Hain. He's going to go to combat trigger and just say, "Hey, you want to trade one of these things off? Let's do it." And I think we'll see that Fatal Push and then probably no block. And the reason for no block would be a Verdurous Gear Hulk next turn can pump up that Rishkar into a spot where it can actually block those three power creatures profitably. Yeah, Ken's taking some damage this game. He's at 14, but he does have a little bit of life to give using that as a resource here. But four cards. Four cards left in hand for Hain as well. I mean, it's possible he's thinking about saving the Fatal Push for, like, say, a second copy of Heart of Kirin or some threat that's a lot harder to block, because after all, next turn, uh, with Verderous Gear Hulk, he'll be able to have two blockers with, you know, more than four toughness, four more toughness, that can hold off that ground attack. On the other hand, you know, he's got to be thinking about Unlicensed Disintegration or some other removal spell taking out his blockers, so, you know, if I were in his seat, I'd be very strongly considering the Fatal Push on Toolcraft Exemplar here. He's also tipped his hand pretty strong here after having tapped that land a couple of times. Uh, yeah. Alex certainly will be keenly aware of the Fatal Push. Not necessarily that he can do anything about it, but... All right, he does decide to use the Fatal Push and then take three damage for the reasons that you described a minute ago. Is there another two-drop? Ooh, there's that Heart of Kirin. So you mentioned this is a downside to killing it before. He did have another one in his hand, and it is unlocked, as you put it. Yeah, and the thing about Heart of Kirin is, despite it being legendary, it so often can win the game if it's uncontested, especially against this black-green deck, which really doesn't have much in the way of flying defense. You know, Ishkana is not a card that's really played a lot in the standard format anymore uh, because of the shifting metagame. And so, you know, it's kind of removal spell or no in many cases for Heart of Kirin, and that makes the legendary status matter a lot less because, you know, if yours goes uncontested, then it doesn't matter that it's legendary. You're just right. going to win the game. Yep. If it gets answered, well, then it doesn't matter that it's legendary because you just play your second copy afterwards anyway. Right. Ken's really th in the tank here. 
mean, it does look like he's decided on playing the gear hulk. He's got to decide how he wants to distribute these counters. But either way, he'll end up with two nice big blockers, at least for the ground threats. That Heart of Kirin, though, is really what he didn't want to see. You saw him take a really long time to decide if he wanted to trade off some life in order to keep that card in his hand so that he could protect against something exactly like this, a Heart of Kirin down the road. And he decided that, no, he needed to maintain his life total because the next turn he knew he was going to tap out most likely anyway for this gear hulk. But so you can see Ken distributing counters in such a way that he has a 6-6 six, six and a 5-5. Five, five. Um, you know, he'd love to get both of their toughnesses up to 6, but doesn't have enough counters to do that. Um, the reason 6 is key there is uh, shock. You know, 3 damage if after it blocks plus a shock would be 5. Allows him to keep the creature alive through that. So he'll have at least one blocker that can do that. Um, that being said, you know, he's still living in fear of unlicensed disintegration, represents a lot of damage. And wow, actually coming in with that Rishkar, trying to set up a, a race situation, which, yeah, he may, he may be wisely deciding, you know, this is kind of my only chance to win the game is actually to put some pressure back on Hain. And, you know, I can't withstand this forever in the face of these recursive scrap heap scroungers and possible top deck removal spells, the flying heart of Kieran coming through. So racing may be his own only option here. But, you know, sadly, I don't think it's... Uh, a super great option as the advantage, I think, slides farther in Alexander Hain's favor. Kind of funny, too. Alex drew another Heart of Kirin for the turn. So he's really <laughs> putting that <laughs> the, our discussion on display for us here about the ups and the downs of having that powerful legendary card in your deck. Heart of Kirin, of course, named for Chandra Nalar's father of Pia and Kirin Nalar fame. Veteran motorist means that this race is absolutely on. Alexander Hain is now attacking for five in the air rather than the four that Ken probably expected. And that means he's going to drop down to three. And it's going to be very tough for Ken to get 14 damage through. Yeah, and now at this point, you know, Ken knows that Alexander doesn't have a, an unlicensed dis disintegration. Otherwise, he would have ended the game on the spot right there but could top deck one at any time. So again, really reinforces that need to set up a race situation and, and kill off Alexander. <laughs> that was a fatal push deck. off the top, Ian. Sorry to interrupt you, but... Yeah, no, no, uh, absolutely. That's, that's a huge draw and, and one of the few things that could actually get Ken out of this predicament. Yeah, that was a big game changer. Now, there is a Scrap Heap Scrounger, of course, in the graveyard for Alexander Hain, and it's, it's got some food the Toolcraft Exemplar, so that can come back as well, and that is also a, yet another lethal threat. All the threats on Alexander Haynes' side of the board are lethal, so Kinyuki Hero oh, is still in a tight yeah. spot. He's got a Hissing Quagmire on the battlefield, plus the Fatal Push in hand, at least. Yep. Attack with both, says Ken Yukihiro. This is a huge attack for him. Six damage from the Rishkar, plus another five is 11. Ken Yukihiro has Walking Ballista in hand, plus an untapped yep. mana. Watch this. Cast it. Do the wow. rest to you, and Ken Yukihiro finds the win. That was fantastic stuff from Ken. Look at that. Unbelievable. I did not oh, expect that at man, all. Oh, man, out of nowhere. It all had to be perfect. But boy, was it. Ken Yukihiro earning the win there by the slightest of margins. We're going to take a look now at our back table. You see it over on the right-hand side. This is Dimitris Triantfilou. He's playing against Donald Smith from Team Lingering Souls. Dimitris is on Conflict Reese. Everybody who watched the uh, World Magic Cup will get that one. <laughs> and it looks like as we come in, Dimitris is the one who's uh, up a game in this match. Now these players are in a, a bit better of a position than the ones on our main table. Uh, both of these players are sitting at 10 and two on the tournament. So they actually have a loss to give to still be live, but man, picking up a win here puts them in a great spot.
So looking at life totals here, looks like Donald Smith was able to get off to a fast start here and, and put some serious pressure on Demetrius. But uh, that Kalidas on the other side of the table for our Team Conflagris player here. Looks like it could put uh, some counter pressure here, represent some life gain. Yeah, may have in fact halted the uh, the assault here, though it looks like Toolcraft Exemplar is feeling feisty. So the mining constrictor is going to block it. The exemplar surviving the exchange because of Depala. You have to get plus two, plus one, and then an additional plus one, plus one. Being a dwarf. This is where Demetrius is supposed to have some removal spells, right? You get to untap with Kalatas on the board and just start mowing down your opponent's creatures. That's the name of the game. Yeah, one would certainly hope so from his point of view. Um, took a little look at his hand there as he was flipping through. It looks like he's mostly on creatures, though. You're right. Yeah, he's I got a Sylvan Advocate. Sylvan Advocate and maybe another Winding Constrictor that's as well. That's correct, yeah. Has he played a land for the turn? Because the Sylvan Advocate looks pretty good. Wow, he did nothing. It looks like he wants to keep up his uh, Hissing Quagmire, rather. Okay. Maybe represent a removal spell that could dissuade Donald from making certain types of attacks. But that Toolcraft Exemplar, it's just getting bigger. It's not, not getting first strike at the moment. So Demetrius is able to trade off his Hissing Quagmire for it. If that's the only creature that attacks, he probably would just make that play. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky, though, if, if Demetrius truly has no instance in his hand. You know, if Donald Smith just uses the extra time to continue developing his board and maybe doesn't make any attacks, then Demetrius is kind of stuck without spending his mana here. But it looks like Donald Smith does come in with the Toolcraft Exemplar. Hissing Quagmire tries to jump in the way. And one of the great uses for Fatal Push, by the way. Killing a creature land. That's right. Converted mana cost of an activated Hissing Quagmire is zero. And that's going to put Demetrius to the test here. Do you want to trade? Or do you want to take four? Mm -hmm. Going down to two against the Mardu deck is scary business. And so he just climbs to do so. He's going to just trade. That's going to give him three life from Kalatas having lifelink. Of course, one of uh, Donald's creatures is going to die here as well. So zombie. Yeah, he says, don't bother grabbing the zombie. I've got, <laughs> I've got a Sky Sovereign that's going to just kill that thing anyway. And that is a major issue as well for Demetrius. This is not looking good. He has been severely behind since we've entered this game and uh, hasn't really been able to find his footing. Yeah, with only four mana and, uh, I believe, lacking a removal spell, he's not going to be able to well, do too much against this board. He drew a Fatal Push now. I see. Just for maximum pain. Yeah. <laughs> the turn he finally blocked with his Kalatas, then the next turn he draws his Fatal Push, but so it goes. So was there a permit that went to the battlefield? No. Okay. He, I, I'm looking at the screen trying to find out how he can target DePaula there. And as it turns out, I don't think he could. And uh, that is going to go ahead and end the game. So that does not end the match, however. Donald Smith just evened things up. So we're going to get a chance to uh, keep an eye on that. And, and we will. I'll, I'll let you know if I hear anything. Though sometimes those matches go pretty quickly. But if not, maybe we'll even have a chance to go back. Of course, that brings us back to our main table, Alexander Hain. Versus Ken Yukihiro. Ken's got a tap land. I uh, see Quagmire to start things off. And a fatal push was the card drawn for his turn.
good old Thraven Inspector for Alexander Hain. Makes a clue and passes the turn back to Ken, who's got an ether hub and looks like a winding constrictor. All lined up. So certainly a much slower start from Hain than we saw in the previous two games here. Oh, yeah. I'm liking Ken's side of this one. I, I don't know if he has any more lands in hand, but if he does, nah, he doesn't. <laughs> but he does have an attune with ether, so I guess he can go get one with that. And he's got the snake. How do you beat that? Well, I guess Alex ans answered that question for me right away, didn't he? Unlicensed disintegration. Takes care of the snake. And now this is tricky because Ken had to spend his one energy from Ether Hub last turn in order to play that Winding Constrictor. And he's also, you know, somewhat constricted on mana, although it does look like he top decked a forest for the turn. So that he helps did. him out a lot here. Still lacking double black, though, notably. If he's got a two drop, he can go a tune with Ether. And then play the two drop. Let's see what he does. First, the attune. That gets him energy. That turns back on the Ether Hub to produce colored mana. He's going to go get a swamp. He doesn't have his land drop for the turn anymore, of course, but I don't have that. And what else does he have? That's what I want to know. Another Winding Constrictor, maybe? Yeah, it looks like it. All right, snake number two. It's a brood. And Alex is going to have to deal with it. Yeah, it is very, very scary to allow your opponent to untap with the Winding Constrictor. Looks Ooh. like that'll have to be the case here, although Alexander Hain adding his own Gideon ally of Zendikar. Yeah, you know, he may be able to just go over the top, and you really don't want to let your opponent untap with the Winding Constrictor, but that being said, if, if you have to, at least you're going to cast one of the most powerful cards in your whole deck. Appetite for the unnatural there for Ken Yukihiro as well. After seeing all of those vehicles in the previous couple of games, he knows he's going to find a good target for that at some point. So taking a look at Ken's hand, he's got a couple copies of Walking Ballista, which of course synergized very well with that Winding Constrictor. They could come down with three counters right away. Uh, other options are, you know, maybe leading up some removal spells, maybe playing a X equals one Walking Ballista for two counters and then casting a removal spell. So what ended up happening there was good old two-for-one there for Ken Yukihiro. He attacked Gideon. Alex went for the double block, but Fatal Push took down the token, and then the Thraven Inspector died to combat damage. So even though Gideon didn't actually end up getting hit there, Ken, a pretty good turn for him. He still gets to play the Walking Ballista with two plus one, plus one counters on it after casting the Fatal Push as well. And what's interesting now is that Walking Ballista, even though it's only at two counters, is actually sort of threatening the Gideon right now. If Alex doesn't tick up the Gideon and just passes the turn back to Ken. Ken can spend four mana to add two more counters to the Walking Ballista and can then have the option to sacrifice it and take out the Gideon. So Alex needs to kind of think about that sequencing as well and decide what he wants to do with Gideon as well as what other threats he might want to add to the battlefield. But I sort of like the way things are going for Ken Yukuhiro here. Uh, he ticked up the advantage bar a little bit in his favor here. Just being able to stick that Winding Constrictor and that Walking Ballista gives him a ton of options to navigate the battlefield from here on out. Cultivator's Caravan is the play after making a knight with Gideon. And take a look at this 5-5 uh, five, five vehicle with Crew 3. You can also tap to add mana of any color to your mana pool. So as things stand, that knight cannot crew the Cultivator's Caravan. So. You know, one, I think one good option here is just to add two counters to the Walking Ballista and take out the Gideon. And, you know, if Alex doesn't have a follow-up play, you know, Ken could be in pretty good shape from there. Yeah, he can even keep his Walking Ballista around if he wants. Right? Just kill the Knight token and attack both creatures at Gideon. Oh, yeah. That's absolutely true. Very, very good. Or just attack first with the Winding Constrictor, you know, see whether Alex decides to chump block or not. That's right. And then make a decision after that. So lots and lots of options here for Ken. That's really the strength of the Walking Ballistas. There's just so many ways to navigate the turns, and it makes combat so difficult for your opponent. We do see, though, a fatal push for Hain, which he can cast off of that Cultivator's Caravan. So that makes things a little bit more dangerous for Ken Yukihiro here. If he goes to add counters to the Walking Ballista, the Winding Constrictor could get fatal push in response, and then instead of getting two counters, Ken would only get one, and that kind of throws off his whole plans as far as dealing with that Gideon. It's the only card that Ken really is thinking about here. Blossom in Defense is another card that we've seen out of the green decks, but the Mardu Vehicles deck doesn't have access to that. 
So it looks like he's going with your line here, which is attack uh, with both creatures. Mm -hmm. So he'd like to put a plus one, plus one counter on this. That is going to prompt a fatal push here, though. This is not going to turn out super well for Ken. He does get to take care of the knight token, because he still gets the one plus one, plus one counter. But Gideon's sitting there with four loyalty after that transaction, so that worked out pretty well for Alex. Yeah, definitely evening things up here. Alex probably breathing a sigh of relief, getting to keep his Gideon around for another turn, just keep squeaking value out of it. Taking a look at Alexander Haynes' hand, looks he, like he's flooded out a little bit. Definitely not playing a deck that wants to draw seven lands this early in the game. Well, or really at any point in the game. Yeah. With just a lone toolcraft exemplar left in his hand here. Still, Hain threatening a lot of potential damage here. We could see, for example, a needle, needle Spire's activation. Attack with Gideon could be up to up to nine damage. Looks like he activates his Shambling Vent. Yeah, he'd like to keep the mana for that card right there, the Toolcraft Exemplar, mm -hmm. it looks like. And we can then go to combat. Toolcraft Exemplar becomes a three-power creature. Can then crew the Cultivator's Caravan. Gideon ticks up as well. So this could be 12 damage coming in for Alexander Hain. Ken has the option to ping the Toolcraft Exemplar before yeah. it gets the plus two, plus one bonus. That's right, that would keep the Caravan at bay. Ken's doing math again. Alex playing very carefully. He's got to feel like he had one stolen from him last game. Yeah, I, I certainly would. And, you know, <laughs> I guess I'd be actually scared seeing Ken doing this math here, especially after what, after what happened last game. You know, Ken is very capable of planning multiple turn races. Ken's letting him do it. Interesting. He says, yeah, go for it. Well, <laughs> Take it all. Four, I go to 21. Yep. That was 12 damage. Ouch. How is Ken going to get his way out of this? Let's see what his game plan is here. He's got a Grasp of Darkness in hand, and he just drew another Walking Ballista. He also has that appetite for the unnatural. So I think Ken's logic there was just, you know, allow the, all those creatures to become tapped. That paves the way for Walking Ballista to get in and maybe kill. finish down that Gideon. Well, he can kill Gideon plus the Toolcraft exit. Very part. true. And then he can actually leave up Grasp of Darkness and Appetite for the Unnatural threatened to take out, you know, both the vehicle and whatever creature lane gets activated. Wow. He can't be happy to be at four, but, you know, when you map out the rest of the turn, that looks good. Okay, there's that other walking ballista. So it looks like Ken deciding to leave up three mana for option of either Appetite for the Unnatural or Grasp of Darkness, depending on what the situation calls for. Um, which makes a lot of sense, because if he pings the Toolcraft Exemplar pre-combat, then Alex can only attack with either with one of his Creature Land or the Cultivator's Caravan, not both. And then no matter what happens, Ken will have the perfect removal spell for whatever that threat is. The Needle Spire's a little awkward against the Walking Ballistas as well. And we're intentionally keeping that advantage bar in the middle here because this is such a close game. Um, Ken, very low on life, but looking like he could potentially stabilize um, with these removal spells here. Alex, on the other hand, was a little short on gas, just top decked that veteran motorist getting that scry. Probably one of the better cards he could have drawn here. Ship both of the cards to the bottom. He's got plenty of mana to work with, he just needs some action. Part of Kieran would look pretty good to him. Though we know that Ken has multiple answers for it. Bottom, bottom. 
Bottom, bottom. Trigger. So we're moving to Alexander Haynes' beginning of combat step. Toolcraft Exemplar trigger on the stack, and now Ken thinking about what he wants to do. And he's going to play Appetite for the Unnatural on the Cultivator's Caravan. And we'll tap for mana. Remember, we're not in Declare Attackers yet. So we could easily see a Shambling Vent get activated here in response, which is what's going to happen. And notably, I believe the Cultivator's Caravan was killed in response to the Toolcraft Exemplar trigger. Correct. So the trigger actually doesn't go off. It needs to, You need an artifact both wet for it to trigger and when it, the trigger resolves. Okay, and then this is a nice clean block, sack, kill. So no life gain for Alexander Hain and no damage taken for Ken Yuki Hero. And Ken loses his Toolcraft, excuse me, Alex loses his Toolcraft Exemplar in the, in the transaction as well. So still a nice close game here. Ken hanging on. He's up to six life thanks to that appetite for the unnatural. A little bit of a cushion for him. And after that nice uh, combat exchange, I, I, I would say Ken is probably favored from this point, although it's still a very, very close game. How about walking Ballista number three, this time with three plus one, plus one counters just mowing down Alexander oh. Haynes' board. Walking Ballista has been fantastic for Ken Yuki Hero against his Mardu Vehicles deck. It really shines in this matchup. Yeah, it truly does. And can you just imagine if the Winding Constrictor had been answered, oh, just how much it. more powerful these winding, uh, Walking Ballistas would be? Yeah, forget about it. Okay, but here comes Scrap Heap Scrounger for Alexander Haynes. So finally a resilient threat that can actually tax those Walking Ballistas and continue fighting through them. Ken's going to take the two damage, putting Alex back up to 22 and Ken back down to four. Just wants to see more action. Remember, he is holding a removal spell in hand still with Grasp of Darkness. He drew a Long Tusk Cub for the turn, though. Yeah. He'll take it. Any non-land spells, I think he's pretty happy with at this point. Yeah, I think that's true for both players. Mm -hmm. This is uh, definitely coming down to a top deck war at this point. It does feel like Ken is slightly advantaged here, doesn't it? I think so. I think uh, between the removal spell that he has in his hand and kind of the onboard mastery of those walking ballistas, he's in pretty good shape. So now with four mana up, he can really navigate combat well. He can pump one of his walking ballistas up to a 3-3, three, three, potentially, which means Alexander can't really make profitable attacks with his creature lands. Instead, just the Scrap Heap Scrounger coming in. So this is kind of a pivotal turn for Ken, because this is like the last turn where he can't really deal with the Scrap Heap Scrounger that well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you see what he did. He blocked first, then he put a plus one, plus one counter on it. Then he used two of them to kill the creature that it was blocking anyway, just to make sure. He was left with two different walking blisses on the battlefield, both on one. And a Thraben Inspector was the draw there for Alexander Hain. Not too bad. Not a high-impact play, but he does get a clue out of it. He's actually not going to sacrifice it here, though. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess he wants to leave up creature land. You know? Yeah, I guess to stop the Long Tusk Cup from getting through and connecting for energy. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. I think Kendra Vergerous Gear Wow. Yeah. Talk about what you love to see in a top deck war. Yeah, that's exactly what he drew. And look at this. Bang! Four counters to splash around. And this is going to get ugly for Alexander Hain and quickly. Oh my goodness. Where does he want to put the counters? He's got two walking ballistas. And even that cub. Absolutely huge top deck here for Ken Yuki Hero. <laughs> I wonder if Alex is going to draw a card after he targets. I, this is getting way out of hand now in Ken Yuki Hero's favor. One, two, one. One, two, one. Okay. And Alex says, yeah, you did it. Right, just going to attack with the Long Tusk Cup. 
And that one counter added to the Long Tusk Cub ensures that it can attack profitably into the shambling vent that Alex Hain had left up. Here's the clue now for Alex. Now, by sacrificing that clue, does that mean that Alex doesn't even have black mana? Uh, now with that Spire of Industry. Yes, it does. He, uh, the Spire of Industry would have made mana with the clue still on the battlefield, uh, made black mana, but unfortunately it doesn't because he's out of artifacts now. And so he's just going to have to take the hit here. It's not a ton of damage, but you know how this thing goes. That first hit is like, eh, okay, that's not too bad. I took three. And then it just gets completely out of hand because it keeps making more and more energy and getting bigger and bigger. Alex is going to use the black mana from Shambling Vent to bring back the Scrap Heap Scrounger. Ken, remember, is still at four. We're in game three here. I have loved how Ken Yukihiro has played this match. He has been fighting and fighting and uh, now is really leading hard on walking ballistas, making life very difficult for Alex. Yeah, a lot of really elegant, um, you know, subtle kind of combat tricks and, and timing here involving the walk, walking ballistas. Definitely a, a great match to rewatch if you're preparing to play a deck like this at FNM or preparing for a, a big tournament coming up. Of course, last time these players played in the top eight of Pro, Pro Tour, Avacyn Restored, Alexander Hain was the Miracle Master, right, with his blue-white Miracles deck. I'm sure he'd love to see a miracle right about now. Yeah, indeed. He may need one as well, Ian, because he is way up against it. Oh, he drew Chandra, though. Let's see what he does with Chandra here. Two damage. Looks like a plus one, hunting for something on the top of his library. Yeah, well, he just put Ken on two. Yep. Remember, the, the plus one, she does two damage to each opponent there if you don't use the card. And so he's just saying, okay, I'm going to trade off my Chandra as a threat, or you're going to have to use up at least some of your walking ballista ammo here to take her down to zero. And this means Alexander Hayden now just a shock or unlicensed, unlicensed disintegration or a second Chandra away from lethal damage. That's right. Now, Ken, can he actually get in for 18? I'm going to assume no, even through a blocker. Though with Ken, you never know. Uh, <laughs> last game, he no cards. No cards. Did a lot. No cards in hand for Ken. Oh, that's not the question you want to hear if you're an Alexander Haynes seat. Oh, here we wow. go. Winding Constrictor. That does change things. Counters. Counters everywhere. Can he just? kill the only blocker left and kill Alex? He's doing the math. So, seven from the Walking Ballistas, five from Long Tusk Cub, that's 12, plus four more from Verter's Gear Hulk, and then afterwards the Walking Just Ballistas empty can out the Ballistas, it has to be enough. 14. So 14 there, and then the Walking Ballistas fire, and that's going to be game. Oh, baby, that was a close one. Look at Ken Yukihiro. You can see how relieved he is. What a stressful match for him, and I'm sure Alex was feeling it as well. That was a huge match and a tough loss to take for Alexander Hain. You know, that does put him with that fourth, fourth loss on the tournament, and for most scenarios, we'll put him out of range of top eight work. You see Ken Yukihiro really feeling the stress and, uh, of course, the elation of having won that game as well because he is still in contention, though. He's got a lot of work to do. We're in round 13. He's still got a few more rounds of all wins to go for the most part. Maybe a draw in there somewhere to make it into the top eight. So not there yet, but his dream is very much alive still. I can tell you that Donald Smith defeated Demetrius Triantfilou. Uh, that was two games to one. That leaves us with this last match here where we've got on the left-hand side of your screen Daniel Grafensteiner. He's playing against uh, Tatsuhiko Oki. And that's Mardu Vehicles versus four-color Copycat. You can see the players' records here. 9-2-1 versus 9-3. One game apiece for these players. So jumping into this game here looks like a pretty fast start for Tatsuhi Tatsuhiko here. A Dipala-fueled Heart of Kirin. 
I'm digging this rogue refiner into Chandra. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> Value central. I love that. Chandra takes out the Paula. Yeah, this, the shields are down, though, for Daniel here with that uh, Heart of Kirin on the battlefield. If Tatsuhiko can find a way to crew it, he can finish off the Planeswalker. Now, things looking pretty good uh, board position wise for Tatsuhiko Oki imagine uh, assuming he can come up with a uh, with a creature here to crew the heart of Kira and take out the Chandra Damn. but that being said keep in mind that Daniel Graffin Center is playing a copycat deck so it's entirely possible that we see him fall behind on board and kind of assume a defensive position but then combo out you know we should talk about that yeah. because it's actually been a significant amount of time on camera since we've seen a variant of copycat go off. Can you can you uh, just run through for people at home exactly what, what we mean when we say copycat? Sure. So the, the cliff notes are if you're able to assemble Felidar Guardian plus Sahili Rai, you're able to create infinite number of 1-4 cats or an um, arbitrarily large number of 1-4 cats and then attack your opponent with them because they have haste. The way this works exactly is Sahili Rai's minus two ability can copy any of your creatures on the battlefield until the end of the turn. The copy lasts until the end of the turn. And if you copy a Felidar Guardian, when that enters the battlefield, it gets to blink one of your other permanents off the battlefield and back on again. So if you blink the Sahili, she'll come back with three loyalty, and she's kind of treated as a new game object. You can use her ability again. And so each time you go through that loop, you're making an additional Felidar Guardian. And you can do that as many times as you want, as long as your opponent doesn't disrupt you. So what we've seen here from Daniel is that he's just added Felidar Guardian to the battlefield, which means at any time, Especially if Tatsuhiko Oki taps out and the shields are down, Daniel can just slam Sahili Rai, start copying the Felidar Guardians, loop that as many times as he wants, and just win the game from there. Yeah, that's something that Tatsuhiko Oki is going to have to really consider. You know, sometimes you just can't do anything about it anyway, which is kind of a relief because you just play and hope it doesn't happen. But, you know, if you have a, a way to interrupt it, like if we look at Oki's hand. Right now, he's got an unlicensed disintegration in hand. He's going to want to keep that up, <laughs> potentially, to uh, interrupt that type of combo. And, you know, I think he's going to be proactive about it here. Yeah, he's just going to use it right now. And that's going to put Grafensteiner in the, in the tank. He's considering using a Dispel here. Yeah, actually, I think both players have Dispel in their hand to kind of fight these, these wars over <laughs> removal spells in the combo. Now, the reason Tatsuhiko wants to go for this in his own main phase is just to make sure he does it while Daniel's constrained on mana. Mm. With, with Daniel only having two mana available, he can cast at, one, at most one counterspell, which he yeah. does in the form of Dispel. But Tatsuhiko knows he has his own Dispel to counter back and make sure that Unlicensed Disintegration resolves. And that's going to make it exceedingly unlikely that Daniel can combo out on the final turn. Seven. Meanwhile, Tatsuhiko getting in with more damage here. And after seeing ex this exchange, definitely thinking things are in favor of Tatsuhiko. Absolutely. He's crushing Daniel in the air here with his Heart of Kirin. Daniel's down to seven. And this is really that formula that the Mardu Vehicles wants to implement. This is the reason why this deck is so popular this weekend against the copycat decks is you're able to put a lot of early pressure on your opponent and then back it up with things like removal spells and counter spells. Just the flexibility, the mana base between Spire of Industry, Ether Hub, and Cultivator's Caravan means you can easily splash both black and blue in your sort of base red white aggro deck. And it, so you're able to put that pressure on and then top it off with disruption. And that's a recipe that classically throughout Magic has been very effective against combo decks. Yeah, he's trying to describe, decide how he wants to proceed. He did find another copy of the cat, as it were. Get some value out of that here. He's going to, but he's actually going to use it to leave up an Ether Hub. Could also target his Rogue Refiner. Yeah, it's, I was going to say, it's almost painful to see him target a land there when he could get so much value out of targeting the Rogue Refiner. Yeah, the reasoning is because he has a Harness Lightning in his hand that he'd like to keep available. Uh, he needs to relieve the pressure 
from that heart of the community. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, well, if you are in the room, please report to the scorekeeper. Today. There's a veteran motorist scale for Oki. Ooh, another unlicensed disintegration. He says, yes, please. I'll put that one back on top. The land can go on the bottom. Now. So interestingly, you know, if Daniel crews up the heart of Kirin, or sorry, if Tatsuyuko crews up the heart of Kirin, Daniel can fire back with Harness Lightning. He has three energy already. He'll get three more for a total of six. He can spend five of that mm -hmm. to take out the... Uh, actually, the yeah, he needed to use the Ether Hub, so he did have to use all five. Oh, oh, oh yeah. all, all six, actually, total, right? <laughs> yeah, five yeah. for the Harness Lightning and, and one for the Hub. So he, he just had enough. But we actually have a one-turn window here where... If he top decks Sahili Rai here, Ooh. he could just win the game. I, I think I saw um, he, he, Oath of Nissa. It, it was Oath of okay, Nissa. Okay, so we get three more looks here wow. to look for that Sahili. Can Let's he find see if it? He can find it. Oh, not the right planeswalker. He found a Chandra instead. Oh man, that doesn't look bad here though. He can use it as a removal spell. He still has two blockers sitting back. Yeah, that's not bad. The trouble is, we know that Tatsuhiko Oki just scried unlicensed disintegration. <laughs> yes, Top. yes. So this was the window. Oh, so close. Yeah, that could have been just an amazing, amazing exchange there. That would have been the match too. Now, is the other card an Elder Deep Fiend that he's deciding between there? Uh, tough to see from here. Yeah, it, the angle's a little strange, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I do believe it is. I haven't seen you in a while. Okay, so this could emerge from the Rogue Refiner, for example. Ah, but he's going to go with yeah. Nissa. Okay. And he's going to plus Nissa. That'll turn a land into a 5-5 five -five creature. Mm -hmm. No Sahili Rai in his graveyard, else he could have used Nissa to get back Sahili Rai. He doesn't know about the unlicensed disintegration from Loki. So Oki in a tough spot here. No super clear, clean attacks. He also needs to be thinking about, does he want to spend any time and, and energy killing that Nissa, you know, with a combination of combat damage and the unlicensed disintegration, or does he just want to go straight for Daniel? I mean, Daniel's only at seven, his Nissa has six loyalty, so it makes perfect sense to go for Daniel himself, but uh, he still does need to respect that Nissa as a long-term threat in the sense that it can, say, get back an extra Feldar Guardian from the graveyard or, you know, give him two chances at Sahili Rai if he finds that. So if the game goes on much longer than Nissa, definitely represents a pretty big threat. So it looks like he does fire off that unlicensed disintegration. Guardian. And he's going to direct it right at Daniel. Are there good attacks? Four. I don't think there's great attacks. I mean, if he attacks with both or six, give me something. Six. Four. Four. If he attacks with all those creatures. He'll lose a, probably the scrap heap scrounger and the veteran motorist, but then the scrounger can come back. So he trades with the rogue refiner. These are all going at Daniel. So blocks are pretty much forced here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Daniel down to four life after the uh, unlicensed disintegration means that it is in his best interest to take as absolutely little amount of damage as possible. He is going to be falling to three, which is kind of nerve-wracking against an unlicensed disintegration deck, but he's already seen a couple of them from Tatsuhiko. One. Two. Three. No. So... I this believe if Daniel top decks Sahili this turn, he can also win because he can bring back yes. uh, the Felidar Guardian from the graveyard, play it, untap a land with it, essentially, and then play the Sahili and go off. Doesn't look like he hit the Sahili here, but still plenty of options at his disposal here with that Nissa Vital Force. He found a tireless tracker with his draw step. 
doesn't have a land to go with it. He's all out of energy, and his mana situation looks a little awkward. Remember, the card he got was that Elder Deep Fiend. He's going to use Nissa to give him access to that Elder Deep Fiend here with the Botanical Saint yep. as well as the Island. Scrap Deep Scratcher coming back for Tatsuhiko Oki at the end of the turn. Unfortunately, I guess he doesn't still have enough, right? Let's see, one, two, three, four. Oh, he does actually have enough. Go. You'd have to lose the tireless tracker, though, wouldn't it? Yep. All right. Good news is Tatsuhito Oka just said go. So if you're Daniel Grafensteiner, you know you can try to get things going with this tireless tracker. He found a land and Ether Hub off the top. Okay, so now what option is to minus Nissa, bring back a Feldar Guardian, and actually blink the Oath of Nissa? And dig, dig, and dig. dig for Sahili Rai. Yeah, that's, I think, why we're seeing these oaths more often now, right? Absolutely. They're very, very good targets to blink with the Feldar Guardian. It just gives your Guardian a lot more utility outside of the combo. Um, first, we have the land, making a clue, cracking the clue, digging a little deeper. So this is a very tenuous balance here. You know, Daniel at three life, he could suddenly lose the game to an unlicensed disintegration. But Tatsuhiko, on the other hand, you know, really defenseless here against the combo, should that come off the top for Daniel. Daniel's got to hold his breath with every draw step from Tatsuhito Oki. He knows he's got two more copies of Unlicensed Disintegration in that pile of cards there. You know, despite the life total discrepancy here, you can almost think of both players at being right on the right. brink of defeat here. Yes. You know, Daniel through a life total standpoint and Tatsuhiko from you know, the threat of the combo with, with him largely being out of resources to defend himself. So tireless tracker down. And Daniel's gonna make sure things he's concerned about here are taking the least amount of damage, which looks like it's pretty well in hand with the 5-5 forest and the and the elder deep feet. And then the other thing he wants to do is set up for the potential ability to go for the combo on his turn and not be interrupted. Okay. So uh, those are his priorities. There's also an angle where Daniel just tries to win the game by damage here over, you know, two turns because, oh yeah, you know, Nissa can make a land into a 5-5, five, five, the Elder Deep Fiend also a 5-6, that's 10 damage, uh, you know, per, per swing here. He just needs to do so in a way that doesn't leave himself vulnerable to a counterattack from those Scrap Heap Scrappers. So it doesn't look like he has the tools to really switch onto offense quite yet, but we could see that. Land off the top of the deck for Daniel. I wouldn't mind seeing that Feldar Guardian oh, come back and blink that oath of Nissa. I want to see it so bad. <laughs> Here we go. Minus three. Okay, Here comes the Guardian. he's doing it. Blink the oath. He's looking through the rest of his graveyard to see what else he's got. <laughs> this is tense. This is cool. Is that Felidar Guardian? Oh, he's actually going to blink Nissa. Okay. And so she's going to give him access to another blocker. Or another Felidar Cub. He could minus that one. Remember, since Nissa left the battlefield and came back, he can use her ability, and he's going to. And he's just going to blink <laughs> Nissa again. <laughs> oh, wow. So this maybe is cool. He is going on offense here, perhaps. He can. Yeah. He can. Uh, now tick her up, make a land into a 5-5, five, five, and attack for 10, and still have two blockers back against those Scrap Heap Scrapters. I like this. Looks this like he's cool. going to play a little bit more conservative than that, and only attack for 5. Though he's still thinking about it. Doesn't want to die to a shock, perhaps. Yeah, leaving back three blockers is, is definitely safer here. That was a metallic rebuke off the top for Tatsuhiko Oki. What in the wow. world is going on here? <laughs> yeah, we've seen now Go. Dispel and Metallic Rebuke both coming in, presumably out of the sideboard for Oki. What comes off the top? A Rogue Refiner. Not bad. Not bad at all.
Oh, Daniel, quit playing with our feelings. I want to see this. <laughs> Let's see what he hits off of this rogue refiner. Couple of energy, we know that. Draw a card. He'll serve into the conduit. Not bad. I mean, he'll take any creature he can get. Yeah, just gumming up the ground at this point. Right. He's going to use Nissa once again. Remember, look at the board for Tatsuhito Oki. He's only got one blocker. Yeah, I'm actually I'm starting to shift the advantage back now in, in Daniel's favor here over these past two turns. He's yeah. just assembled such a board presence with all these Veldar Guardian shenanigans, and now he's able to go on the offense here. And the window for Oki to find that those last three points of damage is just rapidly closing here. This may be the final turn. Let's see what he draws <gasps> off the top. Uh, land for Oki. He's down to seven with no blockers. He's got a lot of lands in his hand. You can see he's got three lands and a counter spell somehow for the Mardu Vehicles deck. Go. And he just passes the turn back and he just ran out of gas. All right, I'm assuming that time has been called in the round here. As I see a, a die hit the table. This is turn one, as you can see. It does look like Daniel Grafensteiner is going to be able to finish off Tatsuhiko Oki. All he needs to do is commit seven power to the red zone. No creature lands on Oki's side of the battlefield, right? Nope. And those scrap heap scroungers are able to block, so in comes the attackers. Yeah, this is going to do it. it. Daniel Grafensteiner picks up the win at a precarious three life for the past, what, five turns of that game. That was crazy. And a he a was lot of cool tricks, too, with those cats. Yeah. Turns out you don't need a million cats. You only need two. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and, you know, that is one of the cool things that you see about these decks, these four-color decks built around that combo, is that they really do take advantage of some of the one-two punches that you can get mm -hmm. by playing cards like these Oaths and things and the Planeswalkers that you can blink and get the value. Now, there's one Planeswalker you really want to blink <laughs> with the Felidar Guardian, but hey, you know, we saw he used it on Nissa twice in a row to generate value each time as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So many crazy little tricks you can do to just kind of grind out the game there. It's really, you know, multi multi-dimensional deck in that sense. Yeah, you can tell that the uh, intensity level is certainly gaining in the feature match area as well as we work our way down the stretch here on day two. That was round 13. A few more rounds to go, and mm -hmm. we're going to have our top eight. That's going to do it for this round here from the booth. Let's send it back to the news desk.
Welcome back to the news desk. Brian David Marshall. You have three rounds to go in standard before we find out our top eight here at ProTour Ether Revolt. Uh, Rich Hagan not here with us today. He's not feeling well, but he was kind enough to have someone write some scores on the doors for me, as he likes to say. So let's uh, recap some of the stuff that's been going down on the floor. Eduardo Sajgalic advances to 10 and 3, bringing down Pro Tour champion even Flock to 10 and 3. Donald Smith, uh, he goes to 11 2 over. Uh, Demetrius uh, Triantafalu and local hero, an Irish uh, player, is uh, doing very well. He is still very much alive for the top eight. He took down a Pro Tour champion this round. Let's hear from Craig Chapman on the floor with our own Tim Willoughby. Thanks, Brian. I am here with the one lone Irish player in the tournament, Craig Chapman. I got a chance to see an absolutely fantastic conclusion to your match last round. Tell us a little bit about how it ran itself out. Uh, ultimately, he, I cast a gear hook. He cast a gear hook. I counted this gear hook. He counted my gear hook. I counted this counter spell. I won. Good old-fashioned magic. And your opponent there wasn't just anybody. You know, when you're playing to get up to ten wins at the Pro Tour, it's always going to be a tough match. Who did you have? Uh, Blowhorn. He's a very, very tough competitor. So uh, it was tough. Like I struggled. <laughs> I got there. Now, Craig, you are the one Irish player in the tournament, but listening to your accent, it sounds to me like there might be something a little bit more going on there. Do you want to explain a little bit about how you're representing Ireland here at the Pro Tour? Yeah, yeah, of course. I moved out here two years ago, so now I'm officially Irish, but like always, always Aussie at heart, so I've always got a soft spot for the boys back at home. But yeah, I'm here now trying to make a name for myself in the magic world and uh, trying to become the Irish captain. Maybe win a Pro Tour if I'm lucky enough. We'll just have to see what happens. And I know that there's a lot of Irish players who are cheering you on, of course. They've got a horse in this race and they're very keen to make sure that it wins. Congratulations to you thus far in your performance. Best of luck in the next couple of rounds. From here out on the tournament floor, it's Tim Willoughby with Craig Chapman. All right. Thank you, Tim, and thank you, Craig Trapp, and continued good luck the rest of the way in the tournament. Uh, I can tell you uh, we're very, very close to getting to the next round, but before we do, we have a deck tech hosted by Hall of Famer Luis Scott Vargas with none other than Jerry Thompson. Let's send it over to Wall and see what Jerry cooked up for this new Standard 4.